Look, in reality, you know, when fear strikes, the mind closes down. So you need to go and learn under the most uh, stringent, I get the uh, conditions. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 694. My guest today, John Giordano. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I founded Whistlekick. Why? Well, because I love traditional martial arts, and so I wanted to do some stuff to support and encourage traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists. We do quite a few different things. So if you're new to our show, to our company, I would suggest that after you listen to this episode, you head on over to whistlekick.com or heck, maybe even go while you're listening. And you can check out all the things that we do. It's a bunch of really cool stuff that we're doing. We're adding new things all the time. And one of the things you're going to find over there is our store. It's one of the ways that we cover the bills here, try to you know, move things forward. And if you use the code podcast15, you can get 15% off a sweatshirt or some protective gear or a training program, maybe a gear bag, lots of cool stuff over there. So go check it out. We're adding new stuff all the time. The show, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website. And you probably guessed what it is if you didn't know already. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week. And the entire purpose behind the show, it's to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to support the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can do that. You could make a purchase, maybe tell a friend about us, or join the Patreon. If you think the shows are worth 63 cents a piece, well, maybe you'll consider supporting us at five bucks a month, and you're actually going to get more content, so that 63 cents is even lower per episode. There's a lot of ways you could look at it. We're proud of the work that we do. We are thankful to those who contribute in whatever way that you do so. And if you want the full list of all the ways you can help us in our mission, as well as a constantly rotating mix of behind the scenes stuff and discounts and some really cool things, check out whistlekick.com slash family. Over the years, I've had the honor of speaking with a number of martial artists who got started pretty early on. They, they were there in the first circles of what I would consider the, the modern iteration of traditional martial artists in the United States. Today's guest, John Giordano, is one of those folks. He wasn't there at the very, very beginning, but he was there pretty early. And today's conversation talks a lot about those early days and the differences in training methods and philosophy. And on top of it, bottom line, how martial arts, as he put it, saved his life. Fascinating conversation. Lots of name dropping going on in this one. This man's connected to a lot of people that we've had on the show and plenty of others that you've heard of elsewhere. So stick around. This is some good stuff. Hey, John, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate being on shows that uh, we can share information with the world. Yeah. Yeah. And we get to talk about martial arts. Yeah. Which is better than that. Not than I know of. (laughs) Other than maybe doing martial arts. If, if, Maybe someday we'll have hologram technology and this show will be us doing martial arts from afar. That would be fun. I think they're working on that, by the way. They are. I, I don't know how far off we are. We'll find out. Maybe if it happens, maybe we'll do this again. There you go. Well, I start off generally in a, in a pretty obvious way, but I think it's necessary because it gives a context for everything else we're going to do. Why'd you start training? <laughs> I'll tell you the funny story. Okay, I was in All gang. I was, in, I was from the South Bronx. I was 14 and a half. I was in gangs. Mm. And we were driving by, a friend of mine had a car, we were driving by a karate school. Mm. So I says, you know, I'd like to see how tough this karate guy is. Let me go maybe see if I could kick his ass. I don't suggest <laughs> that, by the way, for any of your listeners. And um, so we went upstairs, and it happened to be... Uh, a class and we were watching the class waiting for it to end so I could challenge the karate teacher. Mm-hmm. Right? That just shows you how smart he was at, at 14. Time. You were going to challenge the adult. And and half, yeah. yeah. Well, I was a street fighter. I figured I was the toughest kid in sure. the neighborhood. Well, you know, what the hell? So anyway, it was getting late, and my father was very strict, so I had to get back home. 
And I then, I, I told my dad that I wanted to do karate. My mother didn't want me to do it. My father said, no, he's doing it. And at the time, this is in 1962, mm-hmm. you had to be 15 in order to join the class. So my father had to sign a, a letter and I brought the letter and it happened to be a jujitsu class. But what did I know? I didn't know jujitsu, karate is the same stuff to me, you know? So we got in there they taught us how to roll out, how to fall. And mm-hmm. then they put us in a circle and the teacher was teaching how to block a punch. So we asked for a volunteer. Of course, I raised my hand right away. And as he was talking to the class, I tried to sneak punch him in the head. Well, that's not a good idea. (laughs) All I know is I winded from point A to point B. I was on the floor with this little round face looking at me and with a foot in my throat (laughs) and smiling. Well, let me tell you something. I fell in love with the martial arts. Right there. Right there. I got out of the gang and I joined the class. Why? Because it was something that was, to me, was unbelievable. And it was a chance to divert some of my anger. Mm. See, my father was a heroin dealer. He went to jail when I was 12, mm. when I was eight. I got molested when I was a kid. Mm. I used to be overweight and kids used to pick on me. And, you know, typical story, I think, for a lot of people. Mm. And um, I just found a way how to direct all that negative energy Mm. into a positive way. How much of that transition was that event, you, you know, kind of operating within the bounds that you were used to and being sneaky and it not working? And how much was the person, the instructor, because I think a lot of people would have said, you're out, you're done, you're never coming back. And it sounds like that's not what happened. Well, I had a lot of instructors. Um, okay. This particular instructor was Dennis Can, his name was. And he studied with Mr. Visitation, who was with V Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. And he's another famous grandmaster. And uh, I wound up studying with him also. Um, I studied with um, a Grandmaster Hara, Akaru Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. I studied with, um, let me see, a lot of teachers. Uh, Chuck Merriman I studied with. He mm-hmm. came in, he used to come into the dojo and teach us. Um, I studied with Nagabayashi, he was a ninth on, Kota Khan Judo, mm-hmm. um, and then Vinjitsu, and then Moses Powell. Most people know who that is, I mm-hmm. guess. Well, we were brown belts together, and we started with Mr. V. Oh, wow. So that's where I got my black belt from in Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, and also in 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 Kodokan Judo. And I was so, and I used to go six days a week to the dojo. And a seventh day, I would practice at home. And I became the Metropolitan A Judo champion. And I was on the Jiu Jitsu, the demonstration team. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So I, I joined with a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day I walked in, it was Saturday. We had uh, the, the classes on Saturday where everybody worked out, different arts worked out at the same time. And uh, it wasn't a training day, it was just a workout day. Mm-hmm. And anyway, we used to work out with the karate guys and we used to beat them all up, right? So the karate teacher got pissed off and was <laughs> telling the judo and jiu-jitsu to, you know, teachers, look, if he wants to be in karate, they got to join karate class. They can't just come in and fight with my students. So one day I walked in and my friend was in a karate class. I said, what are you doing in the karate class? She's like, join. I said, yeah, I'm joining too. So I went up joining the class. And at that time, there was a new teacher that came in, and that was Grandmaster Frank Ruiz. And he studied under Peter Urban. Mm-hmm. And um, we went there, and he was a Marine DI. I mean, it was the most craziest classes we ever had. <laughs> Crazy how? Uh, well, we used to do knuckle walk on the concrete. We used to do duck walk all around the, the dojo. Uh-huh. So your legs fell off. He In the summertime, they used to shut the windows and the doors and put on the heat. Oof. And guys were throwing up. In the wintertime, they used to open up the doors and, and everything and turn off the heat. And if it snowed out, we would run around in our just in our gi pants with no shoes on around the neighborhood, back into the dojo. Uh, it was a very, very rough class. Uh, sounds that. like that's an understatement. And um, Did you like the, that aspect of it? 
Did I like it? Well, yeah. at the time, I, I didn't like it, but I wasn't going to give up. Okay. You know? Why? Well, because that's who I am. Hmm. You know? Um, so what, what wind up happening, if you want to learn a flying kick, he used to give a live sword, and you had to fly over a live sword. One of the guys, we call him lead feet. Okay? <laughs> he went over oh. his foot. Oh. Uh, we had the toughest school literally in New York. Uh, it- Sounds like it. Yeah. I can't even fathom that style of training. Yeah, we we trained. I mean, we used to hold our shoes in our hands uh, when our arms extended for who knows how long. Your arms felt like they were on fire. You know, we learned how to to block. They would put us up against the wall, Mm -hmm. and another guy would be in front of us, and they would put a belt behind the other guy, and he would come with a shenai, that's a slatted, you know, sword, Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, bamboo sword, and you couldn't go backwards, and you had to not the face, but you had to punch the body, and the other guy had a block at close quarters. And if you backed up, he would hit you with the sheen iron. So that's how we learned inside fighting. Hey, it's a lot so, of motivation you know, there. If uh, if if they trained that way, if I taught the way I I taught years ago, and the way he taught, we'd probably be arrested for abuse so yeah but we trained it's a martial art and we trained martial art yeah. wasn't we didn't train about the sport right. you know and um so i wound up quitting the judo and jiu-jitsu after i became a black belt and i full-time in karate and Why? Uh, i won all kinds talk, of champions. talk about that transition well, they, they all were fighting because judo matches were the same days of the karate tournaments. And sometimes the karate tournament was on Sunday. The judo match was on, on Saturday. And it just became too, too conflicting. So you had um, to pick one, it sounds like. Excuse me? It sounds like the, yeah, the culture was you kind of had to pick one. Karate. Yeah. So, and I love fighting. I always love fighting. And um, so I picked karate. Hmm. And uh, it was uh, it was a pretty wild ride. I, I got so fortunate to learn from so many of the top teachers in the country, and uh, fought in a lot of tournaments, won a lot of national karate championships. And, you know, um, it was just pretty wild. And then I got to meet all the top martial artists, all my dojo brothers, Louis Delgado. Uh, I don't know if you know any of these people. Uh, I know a lot of these names. Yeah, yeah, Taka Zulu, uh, Owen Watson. They had all these different guys, Wilfredo Rodan, um, and all my dojo brothers, Ronnie Van Cleef. Mm. So, you know, Ronnie just put me into the Warriors Black Belt Hall of Fame with 50 other grandmasters. It oh, was cool. the wildest yeah, experience I've ever had in my entire life. We were on Zoom, mm-hmm. and there was 50 guys from around the world accepting the award. Mm. And each one of us would get on and we would accept the award. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Nice. You know, so, sounds like, uh, um, sounds like quite an honor given, you know, with the names that you're mentioning, I'm expecting there were some other big names probably on that. Well, Zoom call. A lot of big names, you know, a lot of people from all over the place. Right. And, um, you know, the martial arts has changed tremendously over the times. And, uh, and, uh, Grandmaster Urban, um, was lived in one of my homes in Florida years hmm. later and uh we used to sit and talk all day long and then uh what, were you, what would you talk about life hmm. life what goes on in life you know he was a different guy we just talked to him privately and he was very eccentric and you know a lot of different things but he's very he was brilliant and uh, he's the one that gave me my 10th thought hmm. and i turned it down so I says, look, I said, Sensei, I don't, I don't deserve that. He says, John, he says, you became a champion. You have, I don't know how many black belts, they're all champions and students. He says, you beat addiction because I'm, I'm a recovering addict. I have 38 years of recovery. Mm. So he says, you beat that and you help tremendous amount of people. Who else deserves this other than you? I said, okay. So that's when I got my grant, my 10th degree black belt. Hmm. What, 
Talk about that relationship with Peter Urban. You know, that's a name that if people know that name, they know how significant that name is. There's someone who, I mean, I, I don't think you can tell the story of martial arts in the United States and not talk about Peter Urban. Well, you know, uh, he knew me since I'm 15 years old. We used to, we're not, when we used to win the tournaments, we used to have to bring the trophies to his dojo and give him the trophies. So, you know, he was always, I never forget it. When I was in Washington, it was, it was a green belt. I was fighting at Joan Reese tournament. Mm -hmm. And I was watching uh, Mike Stone was fighting at mm -hmm. the same time. The Hawaiian Mike Stone. Yeah. And Mike was fighting. And I'm watching him. He's jumping all around the place. Right. And these other guys are static. They're not moving. And he was just beating the hell out of them. I said, wow, what a cool way to fight. He goes, back then, everybody was static. They, nobody moved. They either got stayed in a horse stance or a cat stance or some kind of a stance, you know? And that's the way they were fighting. But he changed it. So I started to do that. And I started to beat everybody up. And one time I was fighting, and uh, Grandmaster Urban was the center referee. And he goes, Giordano, why are you running around? I said, Sensei, no disrespect, but it's hard to hit a moving target. And besides, I was winning, so you know, <laughs> he didn't know what to say. You know. And today, everybody moves around and jumps around. Nobody, you know. Only trouble is today, unfortunately, it's it's. See, back then, it used to be what we called light contact. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I know what you all called light contact. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, kind of like a I don't know, like a zoo. Sometimes what was going on? You hit a guy, knock him over a couple of chairs. Oh, well, you didn't hit him too hard or, you know, whatever. So today it's a game of tag and it's not even resembles fighting like we know. We sure. knew it. It was supposed to be a maiming or killing blow. Uh, it had to be at least an inch to two inches close to the opponent. Okay. Or, or light contact, which most uh -huh. of the time that's what it was. Um, it was completely different. Today, uh, you know, I, I go to a, a tournament in Orlando, the U.S. Open. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that. Well, one of my students, uh, uh, Michael Sawyer, he's the one that throws it. And he was my student when he was, a, you know, a beginner. Uh -oh. I took a purple belt, I remember. And he's such a, a wonderful human being. I go there. He gets on the mic. He says, if it wasn't for Grandmaster Giordano, we wouldn't have this tournament here. Mm -hmm. and, like you said, I really had an impact on his life. And nice. That was really, really humbling and really cool, you know. Uh, I was fortunate to train with some of the top guys. That Grandmaster Ruiz was also a famous Grandmaster. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I, I've heard that name. Yeah. Well, uh, he taught Louis Delgado. He taught Chaka Zulu. He taught Owen Watson. He taught Ronnie Van Cleef. He taught all these guys. Sure, sure. You know. And... Um, he was another interesting person, mm -hmm. you know, and I know him since I was a kid. So everything, as time went on, I then when I studied Hakuru Jiu-Jitsu with Grandmaster Hara, that was another interesting thing. They used to, they used to fight with their arms extended out, and mm -hmm. and, and they used to um, use pivoting like Aikido okay. when they struck to throw people. And a lot of straight arm attacks. And it was a very interesting system. A lot of pivoting. Hmm. So it was a different kind of jujitsu. Okay. And V Jitsu, that I studied with Mr. Visitation, same one that Moses Powell studied with. Uh, we both got a black belt from him. Uh, was Filipino fighting also? We used to do knife fighting, uh, mm. onis, stick fighting. And um, we never used fake knives. I never taught with fake knives either. Always real knives because you lose you lose respect for the weapon. Hmm. And the rubber knife routine and things like that, okay, I understand for safety, but look, in reality, you know, when fear strikes, the mind closes down. Hmm. So you need to go and learn hmm. under the most uh, stringent, I get, uh, conditions. Even though today you can't do that really because... You know, you have all kinds of problems, but sure. that's the way we taught. That's the way we learned. Hmm. And I used to teach the blind also. My black belt was one of the first blind black belts that was a national karate champion. 
Okay. Now let me ask the, the, the obvious question that I'm sure, you know, I can hear listeners later. You weren't just throwing blind people in with live blades. There must've been some variations in how you taught them. No, no, no. Not with that particular, you know, packing them with knives and stuff like that. No, no, no. (laughs) Um, When I was teaching the blind guy, he was, he had retinitis pigmentosa. He was about 95% blind. Okay. So he could see a shadow, but if you moved, you, you disappeared. Mm. And, and and David became a national karate champion in, in kata and forms. Mm. And I also put him in the fight one time. And I put him in a tournament, and the, and the tournament director came up and says, you can't make he, He's blind. You can't have him fight. I said, just don't tell the, don't tell the, the uh, fighter, okay? And if you, if you don't allow him to fight, I'm going to sue you for discrimination so, so they let him fight so <laughs> i brought him to go the, it went good i yeah. brought him to the ring he was shoulder to shoulder right he bowed and he beat the guy so then i brought the cane out and I, he tapped off right the guy sat down and cried literally the guy he beat cried he got beat by a blind guy <laughs> so, i think i might too yeah I think I might so, cry if I got beat in a fight by a blind guy. I mean, well, that's, well, really- that, that's, a, that's the, the subject of, you know, Kung Fu films. Like, that doesn't right. really happen, but here it really happened. Well, well, yeah, most of the people know David, you know. Um, Master Urban promoted him to Night Dawn after 40-something years of training. Wow. And, uh, and David, the way I taught him was really interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to teach him, and he's not understanding what I'm saying. What direction and you know when you when you can't see uh, our our directions are different, mm-hmm. right? So I had to blindfold myself to teach him, mm. and that's how I taught him. Did that so, change anything for you? Oh yeah, it, it 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 gave me his reference points, and we did it by touch. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, forms are intricate, yeah, and you know, directional and 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 the and the way the techniques move and. And uh, are, are performed, and mm-hmm. David won a lot of tournaments with that. So uh, he was the most interesting student I ever had. I never forget. He uh, he's walking down the street, and he's bumping into walls because he didn't want to use a cane when I first met him. So he comes into my karate school, and he goes, uh, "I want to learn karate." And I said, "Listen, I mean, you know, you got to stop using drugs or something." I said, "You know," he says, "No, I I, I don't." Really, I smoke pot, but I don't use drugs. He says, I'm blind. So I said, well, okay, sign this paper in case you die. Okay, I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> so I figured I'd discourage him. He says, I want to become a black belt. So I said, oh, okay. So I put him on the mat. And when you go to stretch David, he couldn't pick his feet off, two, two feet off the ground. Mm. He used to scream when we were stretching him on the wall, right? And fall down on the floor. So I used to, the audience is not going to like what I'm going to say, but I used to kick him to get him up. Yep. Right? So he got up. And then eventually, okay, when he started to fight, as soon as he get touched, he would scream in pain, even though he didn't really get hit hard. Right. So, you know, we kept banging him around until he got used to that. And nobody wanted to fight him because he really couldn't see it. So when he threw a kick or a punch, he usually either got hit well, got hurt. <laughs> it was no control. Sure. But um, David was incredible. He was one of the, the best students I ever had and the hardest to teach. And it was, you know, I, I, if you want to be a good teacher, you have to be a good student. And you really have to learn, you know, from other things and other people because you only can take people as far as you are. So then I was teaching people with handicap, no arms, no legs, one arm, one leg. Uh, all kinds of different people. And Sounds like you made an, a name for yourself. If you can teach teach a blind person, you could teach somebody with one arm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had we had one guy in class. This guy still had the old way of teaching. So one guy had one arm and he had a stump, and and, and it was very tender. And he used to not want to like kind of like block with the stump, you mm-hmm. know. And I says, you got to block, and you 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 know you have to learn how to block. I can't. So I used to hit him with a stick, with a shinai, mm-hmm. and toughen up his arm. And then he was able to block with it. 
you know, it, the old way of teaching was kind of like, kind of, I guess you would say abusive in a way, but it worked. You know, uh, just like when I went to China and I went to the Shaolin Monastery a couple of times and they did a special show for me. It was really cool. And I watched how they train. I mean, they train like animals. They're like running upstairs with water and just like you see in the movies, mm. you know, and uh, it's hard training. It's self-defense. It's a martial art. It's not so much the sport part. I've always thought of that, that old method of training as not necessarily the best for everyone, but for those who could handle it. Well, you know, it got you where you were trying to go. But you see, here's the deal. Who knows who can handle it? You know, most people come in when or people don't understand when the person comes into a karate class, he's really saying, I'm giving up my manhood because I want you to teach me how to fight. Mm. So most people don't. And, and what it's all about, it's not so much about the physical. It's a lot to do with the mental because you have to face your fears. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid, of course, you're not going to function properly. If you get too emotional, you're not going to be able to fight properly. So you have to learn how to control all of that. And how else to learn if you don't put them under combat situations? Mm -hmm. See, and that's what I believe is missing in the martial arts. Because today, because a lot of these kids think they can fight in the street. They can't. Flying kicks, spinning kicks. I mean, I was a bouncer. I was a uh, bodyguard. You know, I, I did all that. And it's not going to work very well, mm. you know. Um, and a lot of these kids think that, you know, you hit a guy once, he's going to fall down. That's not true either, unless you really know how to hit. So, I mean, the whole concept of the martial arts has changed. Now, there are some schools that really teach what I consider the true martial art. Mm -hmm. Not the sport so much, but the true martial art. And the way we learned it, you had to be at least a green belt or a purple belt, if I remember correctly, in judo and jujitsu before you could go up and rank in the karate class. So we were, I was already a black belt, so it didn't matter for me. What was, because you, you talked about there was, there was kind of some, maybe not animosity, but some tension. What was the, what was the thought on requiring that? Well, because, first of all, karate originally uh, in Okinawa, you know, they had sweeps and throws and all kinds of things. Now, I think if I remember history, I was Jigoro Kano came over and they took a lot of that because of political reasons. And they wanted to be able to teach the masses and make it very simplified. So that originally was in karate, mm. but it was not taught anymore. Some of the teachers teach it, but, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of them don't. Um, and, you know, in close fighting and how to sweep, how to use your elbows, how to use arm bars, how to use chokes. Sure. All of that stuff is very valid. It's not just jujitsu, it's the martial art. So, um, to me, you become well-rounded. And that's the most important part. And the discipline and the focus and using your inner energy, okay, to apply your techniques. It's not just a physical thing. It's getting in touch with your the light inside of you. Mm. And it's not about beating anybody up or fighting. It's about avoiding all of that. You know, people think, oh, a karate guy, you're going to fight all the time. No, no. You shall always be aware as one of our tenants. And a karate calm must be gentle in life but ferocious in combat. And that's the way I learned. And you had to be quick to seize opportunity. So all these different sayings and tenets was um, instilled in me from a little boy. And the best way to fight somebody is not to fight them. Hmm. Most people don't get that part. You know, uh, especially today, you know, you get sued, you go to jail, or, you know, you can hit somebody, they fall down, hit the head, they die. You know, yeah. people don't yeah. think about that. Yeah. Who really wins in that situation? Nobody. And, the, you know, and, and what the martial arts are to me is to create better human beings. Not just to be a fighter or, a, a, you know, a kata guy, 
and all of this, it's it's to be a better person, mm-hmm. you know, and um, take the my martial arts as a vehicle to get to that destination. I agree. Yeah, we well, talk about it on the show frequently. Martial arts makes people better. Absolutely. Listen, and we, we all need life. that. We're not yeah. all going to get in a fight, hopefully very rarely, if ever, but we all can benefit from, you know, some of these, these other things that wrap around the physical training that come from the physical discipline. When taught properly, and that's important when I say taught properly, because a lot of teachers don't teach properly, mm-hmm. unfortunately. They're more about the tournaments and you had a rah, 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 and all that stuff. It's, it's really about how to be disciplined, how to focus, how to face your fears, mm-hmm. how to be kind. You know, and there's a lot of tenets to the martial arts that changed my whole life True. in many, many different ways. And when I, when I started using drugs, I didn't start using drugs until I was 20. And then I went on that journey with the drugs and the alcohol and all this other kind of stuff for until I was about 37. Okay. So can, can we talk about that? Because, you know, it, it's, I think it's often really easy to, to point at a situation, you know, somebody who doesn't train could listen to up till now in our conversation, they could say, you know, you know, he's, so he starts doing martial arts and he's got five years of martial arts under his belt. Clearly it, it, it didn't work. It didn't do anything for him. He turned to drugs. Obviously, life is more complex than that. And you gave us some some ideas of what you were coming from. You know, you, you mentioned the environment you were growing up in and everything. So can, can you talk about how, maybe why you went into drugs and okay. why you came out? It, it was, it, here's the deal. You know, just because you learn something, knowledge is power, but without action is worthless. Mm, Great point. Okay. So I had the knowledge. Okay. But I met a girl and, you know, we started partying together. You know, the typical thing that starts off, it was fun. And this was in the 60s. So everybody was doing drugs. Everybody was partying. And, you know, it was that kind of crazy time. And, Mm -hmm. And who realized that, you know, that it would be so severe? It wasn't um, as severe as it is today, I believe. Mm-hmm. You know, not that it wasn't severe back then, but compared to today. And what was interesting was, you know, I, I started to get more and more crazy. I started to use my martial arts completely opposite from what I was teaching and what who I oh, was. I used to do collection work for the smugglers. I used to sell drugs. Uh, I used to teach the cartels, bodyguards, self-defense. Um, it's in my book that we can talk about later if you want. Yeah. Uh, and but what happened when I got clean and I went to I went to treatment and like I said I'm coming up in 30 years in recovery without relapsing. Congratulations. Ronnie went back into my life in a different way. Uh, I never forget it. After I got out of treatment, and I said to myself, you know, I want to compete in state championships. Well, you know, just starting, they were going to uh, start in about a week. So I says, I, I'm going to go enter. So it was like, I haven't, I didn't compete in years. Hmm. So I just decided to enter. So I, I took the state championships, but it was so funny. I was fighting uh, one of Joe Hess's black belts. And he was a big six foot three guy, six, four, you know, huge. He was Don Johnson's bodyguard. Okay, um, that says something. <laughs> right. So him and I got into it. Yeah. And I beat him. But after the after after the uh, the match, I looked like I lost. My D was torn off me. I was I couldn't even hardly walk. I was all banged up. <laughs> you know, so they call that winning, but I don't know what yeah. they want to call it. But you know, and, and that's how I started again, you know, back into the martial arts. And I was in the martial arts all along, but I took wrong directions, you know. And it didn't, the drugs didn't start really having a bad effect on me, a negative effect until later on in the last five years, actually. Interesting. See? Can, can so, you say more about that? Well, what, what went well, I did, um, let, me, let me put it to you this way. Let me see. It was 1965, okay? And 
I think I just started smoking pot. I was doing some, I, I don't remember. But what happened was I, I had the United States International Karate Championships. Mm-hmm. And we had people from all over the world came to the tournament. It was my tournament. And at that time, if it was your tournament, you could not fight in the tournament. Okay. So we had, I, I also used to teach dancing. So I was, I was a professional dancer also. Where I did that come in? We, we... <laughs> okay. When did you have time for this? Oh, wait, if, if you read, if you know my story, you, you, you know, everybody okay. says the same thing to me. Okay. Um, so what happened was when, when I first came to Florida at 17 and a half, okay, uh, I went into a dance studio. I was a pretty good dancer. You know, my mother was a semi-pro dancer, and you know, okay. I learned how to dance. And um, I came in, I said, I want to teach dancing. And the guy said to me, uh, all right, let me go out to the pool. And see if we can bring some people in for a, a complimentary dance lesson that we used to sell them dance lessons. So I got most of the pool to come in. Mm-hmm. And he was watching me dance and he pulled me aside. He says, look, kid, you're not a bad dancer, but you're not a dance teacher. He said, but you're a hell of a salesman. So he says, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. You're going to come into the private room. I'm going to teach you a few steps. You're going to go back out and teach them. And that's how I then we used to dance in a nightclub. Uh, we used to have um, on Tuesday night was champagne hour and on Friday night where they called it Mambo Jamboree where all the dance teachers from all the hotels in Miami Beach would come and we all would dance with our students. So anyway, all these black belts came and my all my dojo brothers, because I was having trouble with the Florida black belts. When I first came to Florida, uh, they didn't like a, a New York boy coming to Florida, mm-hmm. coming, you know, and what happened was I was with uh, John Pachivas in New York and uh, Grandmaster Rose introduced me to him and said, look, Johnny's coming to Florida. Okay. So maybe you could take care of him. Um, so what happens, I, let me digress for a second. Yeah, I, I got to tell you how I got my black belt. Okay. In karate. Well, I'm going to Florida and I, you know, I didn't have all my katas down and stuff like that. And I wanted to get a black belt because I had a black belt judo, black belt judo. So I wanted to have a black belt going down to Florida. And Grandmaster Ruiz was like kind of pissed off that I was leaving because I was one of his top black belts. Mm. So he said, okay, you want a black belt? Okay. You have to win at Gary Alexander's tournament, which is the biggest tournament in the country at the mm-hmm. time. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was in, No, uh, but uh, he was on the show very early on. Oh, Gary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very kind man. Yeah. So he had his tournament, which is the biggest tournament in the country. And then it was uh, Pete Saragano uh, had his tournament in um, uh, Staten Island the next day. So he says, you have to take first place in both tournaments if you want your black belt. I said, sensei, can I take second in one of them at least? He says, okay. So I fought about nine times in Gary's tournament. And the 10th time I won and I took first mm-hmm. place in his tournament. Wow. Then I fought in Staten Island the next day. And I was going against my dojo brother, Carlos Serrano. And um, I used to wear a judo gi. Mm-hmm. So, you know, judo gis are very big. Yeah. Right? So what happened, Carlos threw a sidekick, and it was like four inches away from me, you know, because it hit my gi. Right? And they gave him the winning point. It. And he said, no, 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 no. It, 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 He said, no, 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 no. So it was for first and second. So I took second. I said, look, I don't care. I'm going to get my black belt. I don't really care. So when I went to Florida, I went to uh, Johnny Pachivas' school, which was in in City Hall. They had a a, a little play, a vestibule where they would teach, right, in the lobby there. Hmm. So I go there and I said, remember me, Sensei? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you from New York. He said, why don't you gee up? So I gee up. I come on. I come on the mat uh, on, on the area there. And uh, he goes, uh, you want to fight? Do you want to spar? You want to do comité? I said, sure. Which black belt do you want me to fight? Oh, no, no, no. I want you to fight this brown belt or purple belt, whatever he was. So I said, no, no, I'll fight your black belts. He said, no, no, I'll fight him. Well, literally, no, this, it was Steve Beatty. Now, I don't know if you know that name. I don't. Yeah. Well, he... Um, he was this big, big weightlifter guy that beat all the black belts anyway. They were sandbagging him. So, you know, yeah. 
So anyway, he was a real tough kid that really tried to hurt you. Mm. So I bow in with him and we're joining around. I throw a round kick to his head and I pull it back nice. He throws a side kick to my ribs. And if I didn't block it, he would have broke my ribs. Mm. So he looks over to Bachivas and Bachivas smiles at him. So I said, look, I'm from New York. I said to myself, I know what this is about. Okay. So BD come running in. I hit him with a short back kick, picked him up in the air, dumped him on the floor where he couldn't breathe. And I bowed out and I said, thank you very much. But no, thank you. Have a nice day. And I left. Mm. So from that day on, I had black belts every month coming to my school trying to beat me up. I would beat them up and send them back home. <laughs> That's a true story. I mean, I, anybody I, knows I, me. We, we, have, we've heard this style of story a number of times, enough times from this generation that, that I, I, I have no doubt. I've heard the stories. So um, what happened was, please continue. I, when I threw my tournament, right, we, the guys came into the nightclub, the, the party, and there yeah. I am dancing on the stage doing go-go dancing. <laughs> so <laughs> we're at the Black Bull meeting the next day, and they're all laughing, saying, oh, yeah, you want to, you want to do it? Fine. You, you can, but your, your, your guys cannot referee you. He goes, all the guys came down from New York. They all shaved their heads. Louis Delgado, Owen Watson, Ronnie Mink, all of them came down to support me. Mm-hmm. Right? Grandmaster Ruiz. Because I was having such a hard time with all the black belts down there. Mm. So what wound up happening was, you know, back then when you're lined up, they they line up next to each other. You fight the guy next to you. So they mm. kept on playing musical positions, putting the best guy next to me. So I had to fight about eight times. Mm. And I got to the finals and Louis Delgado got to the finals. Mm-hmm. And now they put Louis and I against each other so they can eliminate me. Mm. So Louis and I clash. Louis falls to the ground and makes like his knee hurts. I said, Louis, what, what are you doing? He says, you got to fight him. He says, I can't fight anymore. I hurt my knee. <laughs> so Louis disqualified himself. And I'm mm-hmm. fighting a guy named Bob Bremer. Now, Bob Bremer was like 6'4". He was a real big guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was one of the toughest guys. Matter of fact, he went to Okinawa and beat up all the Okinawans. So here I am, and the place was dead silence. You can hear a pin drop when we bowed in. Now, Bob would come running at people, and they would run away, okay, because he came like a, like a freight train at you, mm. right? But this kid from New York doesn't run away. Mm. So we kept clashing and clashing. I got a point, he got a point, I got a point, he got a point. Now, the last point, a guy in the audience, and I can't believe this happened. I got the picture. I don't know if I sent it to you, all right, of the winning point. Mm. And you can see how big he was because when we went up in the air, I'm punching him in the mouth, all right? And the whole place went like bananas. It was like crazy. And I beat him. Mm. And that's how I started my reputation in Florida. And him and I became really good friends. And Bob was the kind of guy that didn't become friends with not many people. I called him up and I said, it was an honor to fight you, which it was. He was really a good, a good fighter, you know. And that's how basically I became, you know, known in Florida. Mm-hmm. And I brought Nisi Gojuru to Florida in 65. And all my black belts, Herbie Thompson, I don't know if you heard that name before. Herbie's one of my black belts. Um, he has all his students. I taught in Liberty City in Overtown. That's the, the African American community. Most of my black belts are black. Hmm. And it was a really funny story. Here I am. Herbie had a school in, uh, in uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, YMCA down there. Carver hmm. YMCA. Anyway, he says, would you, Sensei, would you come down and teach my class with me? I said, sure. So I come down. I Here I am with long hair, with a handlebar mustache. I'm wearing my karate gi, no shoes. And I walk in the front door. And I was the only white guy there. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm from New York. I don't know about color. So, you know, who the heck knows? So anyway, I walk in. They were shooting pool. Everybody stopped shooting pool and looking at me. I walked into the weight room. Everybody stopped picking up the weights. And I walked to the back of the class. So a weightlifter comes back and he goes, hey, white boy, you think you can kick my ass? I said, yeah. 
So I says, well, why don't you get on the mat? So his, his arms were big as my thigh. <laughs> so he, t- he tried to sneak punch me, and I round kicked him in the solar plexus and dropped him to the ground. And as he can't breathe, my teacher, well, my student walks in and goes, oh, I see you met my teacher. Now, Herbie was, used to be a gang leader in Liberty City. Mm-hmm. And then he went to Vietnam and he used to fight with Tiger Kim. And um, he was really, they all respected him. He was really a tough kid. Yeah. So that's how I started getting my students. They would come in, I would fight them, beat them up, and they would join. <laughs> that was just the way it was. Not, not, yeah. a, not, a, not a solid recruitment strategy. In the, well, current, yeah, in the current era. I wasn't, you know, this is how you recruit, and, sure. you know, with, with gang kids. And they don't respect you unless you, they know you uh, tough enough to beat them up. I didn't want to beat them up, but, you know, they try to beat me up, so I'm defending myself. Sure, I get it. You know? But anyway, and uh, we won all kinds of tournaments. We were the toughest school in the state of Florida, one of them anyway. Wow. And um, we went to New York. We fought in the tournaments in New York. We beat most of the people, uh, most of my black belts uh, are all champions. Um, we also had the Miami Vice karate team. And they had the Budweiser team. They had a whole bunch of teams back then. Oh, yeah. And we traveled all over the country competing. And I was coaching it. And there was uh, Tony Palmore. There was Reggie Tucson. There was all these guys, one both field, Joe Anon. There was all kinds of all champions. Mm-hmm. Okay, kickboxers, karate guys, all kinds of guys on the team. And um, we would go around competing for about a year and a half. And I competed, I think, about, I don't know, 35, 40 tournaments. Wow. Yeah, so I won a lot of, I, I wasn't fighting, I was doing forms. Because I challenged myself because I had a hard times with forms. Fighting, I always loved fighting, so mm. that was easy for me. But to be disciplined... And have to focus and have to do it a certain way, that was hard for me. Yeah. And so then I really practiced and I did that. And I did Seipai Kata, which was a difficult kata. Uh-huh. And uh, I think I won, I don't know how many trophies I had. I, I, I just took off the, 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 the letters and threw away the trophies because when am I going to do it all of these things? Right. But that's what we did. And we beat the Budweiser team. That was Chuck, Chuck Merriman's uh-huh. team. That's a big deal. And nobody yeah. beat them. Only, you know, they had, uh, uh, what's his name from Tybo? Billy, Billy Blanks. Blanks. Yeah, Billy's a friend of mine also. And so uh, I know Chuck Norris. I know Bill Wallace. I know all the guys, yeah. you know. But uh, even Bruce Lee, when um, Louis Delgado went to uh, California, he, he worked out with Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and all the guys. They wanted me to come to California to teach the movie stars. I said, nah, I don't want to go to California. And I was in Florida. So I, I was doing plays at the time, hmm. Kabuki theater plays. And I said, nah, I don't want to go. But so Bruce Lee heard about me teaching the blind and doing all this stuff. So he sent me a letter that he was sending a student to me in Florida to train. Hmm. Not a blind student, but a regular student. Right, because he heard from Louie and all the guys about me and all this kind of stuff. I said, okay. I never kept the letter because oh, I didn't know who yeah. he was. It was Bruce Lee, you know. And uh, that's how I got with Bruce Lee. And one of my good friends, who's a uh, a writer, he's the one that wrote The Legend of Bruce Lee. Oh, right on. Oh, yeah, he knows the family, Alex Ben Block. So, you know. And uh, the way I met Alex was, see, what I did was, I, I had the International Karate Championships. And I had people from all over the world come to compete. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I want to do something different. I want to do art mixed with sport. Mm-hmm. So what I did was we had the finals at night, mm-hmm. right? And then very limited. And then we would have a commercial, a calm break, you know, in between a 20-minute break. And then what I did was I, I, I wrote a story about a, a young Shaolin uh, kid trying to be a Shaolin monk. Mm-hmm. And we had a storyteller off stage, and we had um, white face makeup on. We had people hidden in the audience. And what I did was I uh, I put into the storyline karate demonstrations. Those were his challenges. Mm-hmm. So I, I do a, a thing where I blindfold and I cut a cucumber off somebody's stomach blindfolded. I do a, I break concrete on fire with my head. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't too good after all. <laughs> I'm already nuts. I don't have to be more nuts. But anyway, um, and we had like all kinds of different demonstrations, guys breaking uh, ice with their head. And, uh, and I did a thing where I saw this guy in a magazine catching arrows, right? I said, mm. oh, if he could do it, I could do that, right? Well, I didn't know he used a 10-pound pool bow. I used a 40-pound pool <laughs> bow with 30 feet. Not too smart. Anyway, we put a foam tip on the arrow so I can have to practice. It almost took my eye out. Uh, you know, I caught four hours, arrows out of 10. That's not and, bad at all. No, I think but it wasn't good enough for the show. Sure. So what I did was one of my black belts was an archer. So and this is a crazy story. So what happened was he was supposed to shoot this arrow at my chest. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to move out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. And continue fighting or doing whatever I was doing at the time. So we had to put a, a, a plywood side stage so the arrow wouldn't kill the, the curtain guy. Yep. So Bobby, what happened was he was an epileptic also. He had an epileptic seizure. Right? The guy with the bow? <laughs> yeah, the guy with the bow. So Seems like a bad uh, combination going in. Yeah, well, that was really. <laughs> so it happened 20 minutes before he had a seizure. And nobody wanted to go near him because he was like flailing around. So I went in, like dived on him. And we went into a closet. All the glass jaws with screws all fell on top of us. Mm -hmm. So I'm rubbing his temporal lobes. I finally, you know, I helped him before he started swallowing his tongue. And he finally came out of it. And we had about, I don't know, about 15 minutes to go before I had to go on mm -hmm. and do this arrow thing. And now the kind of arrow that we used was a hunting arrow with the blades on both sides. Yeah. Okay. I was a little nuts. I, I, there was a lot of things that, that was pretty crazy. Anyway, I said, Bobby, can you do this, man? I said, you know, you're going to shoot this at my heart. If you mess up, I'm dead. He said, no, no, I can do it, sensei. He says, oh, okay. So here I am. Trust. And he jumps out and he starts talking like Japanese. And he goes to shoot the arrow at me. And let me tell you something. I don't know if you ever experienced anything like this. I was so scared that I didn't even realize how scared I really was. Okay. When that arrow was coming at me, it looked like it was going in slow motion. That happened to me once before when I was in a car accident. Mm -hmm. It looked like it was slow motion. And I just barely turned away and it sliced my uniform. And then went into the the the, the board, plywood. yeah, right, and almost killed the curtain guy on the other side. Yeah, it went through the board, but not enough to hit him, right. So afterwards, wow. the curtain closed, and I jumped backstage. I said, "Why didn't you shoot it the way I told you? You should have used it full blast." He said, "Sensei, you couldn't even see the arrow." That's how fast it went. It was only 30 you feet. Thought it was, you thought he had slowed it down. Yeah, I thought he slowed it down. But that's how the brain works. I remember I was in a car accident in Belize, and we flipped over, mm -hmm. and everything looked like in slow motion. And that's what happens. The brain, I don't know if you call it speeding up or slowing down, but I saw everything going on as we were, as we were flipping. And as a matter of fact, I broke my back in that one. And I broke three transverse processes and I threw the girl I was with out of the car. And then I couldn't get up. It was like somebody put a, a, a hot poker in my back and I crawled out on my hands and knees. And I went to the, they took me to the hospital and the guy's telling me to, to lay down. And I, I couldn't even stand up. So they finally took an x-ray of me standing up barely. And they're looking at the x-ray and I'm looking at it. I'm saying, I don't think that line belongs there. No, 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 it's, it's normal. Well, I went back to the United States and, you know, put me in a wheelchair and went to the, into the plane and they said, you're lucky you didn't lose your, your, uh, your um, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know, one of your organs or something. I forget what he said. Anyway, um, I went to the doctor and I kept on doing um, electrical stem, electrical stem for three months mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. I, and then I started teaching karate again. After three months. So the doctor says, how do you do that? I said, I don't know. 
That's crazy. You know? wow. So that's some of the crazy stories that go on in the martial arts with me anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I want to correct myself because I said Gary Alexander. I was thinking of someone else. My apologies. He has not been on the show. Uh, but I, I want Gary to talk about by the way. If I'm not mistaken, I heard that. If that happened, that was really recent. So I yeah, heard. it was recent. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that up when we're done because he's been on the short list for a long time. Somebody I'd love to have on the show. Uh, but but I do I do want to talk about the book. I'm I'm going to guess that a lot of these stories you've told us are similar. They're probably in the book, similar to other yes. stories in the book. And as someone who has written a couple books, I know how much work goes into them. So I always like to ask authors, why? Why did you want to write a book? Okay. Well, you know, I deal with addicts and alcoholics. I'm one of, like I said, one of the leading experts on addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, here I am. I only went to the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. My family was uh, a mafia type family. Mm -hmm. My uncle was a hitman. Matter of fact, my uncle threw my wedding when I was 20 and the caterer insulted my uncle in the wedding. So he killed him the next morning. So, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You got to get the book. You'll, you'll read all about it. Okay. Matter of fact, they might be making a movie out of it. Uh, Sandy from Below Deck, mm -hmm. uh, the television show. She mm -hmm. wants to be my producer. And that because of all the layers of, of yeah. this book, me being molested, my uncle killing the caterer, my family being a mafia kind of family, you know, my journey through everything and her, my karate and all this other kind of stuff. And what wind up happening is that I only went to the ninth grade. And, and here I am, I lecture all over the world at neuroscience conferences. I've written three books and co-authored another book. Wow. I work with 25 universities, okay. doctors, scientists, and researchers. Um, I put all my karate energy into the addiction field. Mm. And I also talk karate to addicts and make them like they're fighting their addiction. Mm. So I did that also. Powerful. And so what, what happened was I said, you know, I need to write this book to show people no matter what education you have, no matter what family you come from, no matter if you're an addict or not, no matter how down you go, just never give up. And, and, and what I wrote in the book, on the back of the book, it says, there is one thing in the world, one special lesson, one constant. Let me see something. Oh, okay. Wait a second guided me through the turbulent water of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstance, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams. Never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. So that's, that's deep. That's heavy stuff. When I show people, well, it, it gets a little heavier. When I, um, I went back to school, I got my GED. Uh, I, I did, and I owe this to my karate training, by the way. You know, I got back on board with what I learned, how to be disciplined, how to be focused. You know, I'm never to give up no matter what. And um, there are no failures in life. There are only lessons. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with those lessons that changes your life. So what I did was eventually I, I started a, a, a treatment center. Early on, I got betrayed by my doctor, by my therapist. I, I've been through a lot of stuff. And anyway, I started this company with $300 about 18 years ago. And 2012, we sold it for 45 million. Wow. Congratulations. So that's great. That's my journey to success for people to show them. Now, if you would have told me this years ago that that's what, how I would have wind it up, I probably would have punched you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thinking you're making fun of me. <laughs> it wouldn't have surprised me if you punched me in the face, given yeah. what we've heard. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and that's, and, and, this, and the book is called The Kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. Mm -hmm. So if they want it, it's on yeah, it's Walmart, it? it's on Amazon, okay. it's on Barnes and Noble. Okay. So Great. you know, that's what I do with my life today. I lecture, I do podcasts, you know, helping people to show them, give them guidance, you know, mm -hmm. just sharing information. You know, I don't tell anybody what to do. I just say, 
here's what I learned. And if it fits for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't do it. So here's a question, given that, you know, there's been a thread of, of challenge throughout your life. And some of it was, was self-induced. Some of it was chosen beneficial, probably all of it in some way was beneficial. Would you have changed any of it? That's an interesting question. I had another guy ask me the same question. You know why would I, what I would have changed? Hmm. Absolutely nothing. Not even the worst it's parts. Not anything, because everything led me to where I am today. See, there are no coincidences in life. All our journeys lead us to where we are. So why would I change something? I don't ask that question often, but I don't think anyone has ever said anything other than that. Because especially the folks who have been on, who have been through, I think, the heaviest stuff, because that's usually when I ask it, they recognize that it's where they are and and they're, they're digging out or escaping or whatever verb you think of from that stuff. It took all of that stuff to create the situation, to get them out, to launch the company that, that could be grown and sold off. And, and, you know, would you be doing the work that you're doing, helping people now, if you hadn't gone through all of it, right? Like you were on your path. Well, you know, I I took all my karate training and applied it to the addiction field. And I became one of the leaders in the addiction field on alternative medicine. And um, I learned some stuff that is so wild that I just learned a new thing. uh, Matter of fact, three weeks ago, Mm -hmm. something that blew me out of the water. And I don't usually get uh, so enamored about something, you know, I just go, yeah, okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Let me see. I always do things. I, I experience the things myself. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to tell you about something, I, I want to go through it. Sure. Then I want to see other people that have gone through it. So I don't think I was hypnotized. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I just came across this doctor who a friend of mine is a lobbyist in, uh, in Washington. And he deals with uh, putting bills in with the senators and mm-hmm. All kinds of stuff. And he also is with alternative medicine. And he turns me into this doctor. And, you know, I have back pain. Mm-hmm. And I throw all the karate. I have two hip replacements, you know. And so I says, okay, I'll go. So I said, a chiropractor? Look, chiropractors are good, but some are bad, some are good. Mm-hmm. I said, no, no, this is not like a chiropractor you've ever been for, too. I said, okay. So I go there, and there's an NFL player there. There's a senator there. There's all kinds of different people in the waiting room. They're all telling me the story. So I said to myself, okay. So I go in and the, it was the weirdest experience I've ever had. I have to be honest with you. He says, uh, he gave me some tests and he says, okay, I want you to close your eyes and march, march in, 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 in place. So I'm marching in place. So he said, all right, open your eyes. I'm six feet away and I'm turned to the right. I go, how the hell did I get here? Okay. So he's explaining to me how my body's off. Okay, how my vertebrae is off and how my balance of my brain is off. I said, okay. So we go, and my, one leg is shorter than the other than I have. It's about three quarters of an inch and it's shorter. So, and I limp sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I go get an x ray in my neck, right? He deals with the atlas. The atlas is the top bone in mm-hmm. your vertebrae, okay, where your nerves go through and your blood supply to your brain. Mm-hmm. So, we go there the next day. I give him the CD with the with the, uh, uh, the X-ray on it. He looks at it, shows me my neck. What's going on? It's impeding my blood flow to my brain, mm-hmm. and another part of the neck is impeding my nerves down to my spinal column. Puts me on the table. Now wait to hear this. This is what blows me away. Okay, he does not touch me with his hands. Mm-hmm. Okay, he gets this machine that he redeveloped. And he puts this little bar right towards my neck, just barely touching it. You don't feel anything. He calibrates it and sends a frequency to your atlas and realigns it. Then he asked my wife to come to the end of the table and look at my feet. They were even. They didn't touch me. I said, what? I get off the table. I have no pain. That's not where it ended. My wife, same thing. Now, the next morning, I see better. 
Hmm. I'm saying, what the hell is this? Okay. And I haven't, my mood has changed. It's hmm. up more. And so with my wife. So we're going, this is really, really weird. So I'm looking all this, I'm talking to the doctor. And he's explaining to me why this is happening. They work, it works with PTSD, it works with depression. It works with all kinds of different pains. And, you know, in addiction, when, when people come to get detoxed, what happens is they're on medications, they get an injury, they take opiates or opioids, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so we get them off from everything, but now what do they do with the pain? Right. Okay, we tell them stretch, do yoga and stuff like that. That works okay, but not really. Okay, to the point where they don't want to go back on opiates and they go back. Right. This technology is unbelievable. I also work with hyperbaric medicine, HBOT. Mm -hmm. I work with amino acids. I I do a lot of stuff. That's why I'm in currently I'm in now 77 medical and scientific peer reviewed journals. Oh wow. Well. Yeah. So that's where karate brought me. Mm -hmm. And I really believe if it wasn't for karate. I wouldn't be talking to you today in the way I am. Okay. Sounds pretty clear that without karate would have been a very different outcome and uh, very different, likely a, a, a very exciting and maybe shorter life. Based yep. on what you're well, I didn't think I was going to live past, you know, when I was in gangs, I was 14 anyway, sure. 15, 16, I think I'll be dead. Yeah. You know, people shooting at you and people trying to stab you. And, you know, I'm, I was from the Fort Worth neighborhood in the South Bronx, which was where Fort Apache was, the police station. They wrote about it in Time magazine, saying it's the worst neighborhood in the whole United States where I was from. I had to sneak home at night so nobody knew where I lived. Okay. So that's my background. <laughs> that's, that's a story. That's cool. that's, yep. And that's what I share people right. give them. Uh, so before before we close up, I, I just want to remind folks, you mentioned the book. Uh, and I, if I recall, you have a website? Yes. Can I tell people about that? Yeah, it's John, the initial J, Giordano.com, G-I-O-R-D-A-N-O.com. Okay. And the book is The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. And so this is where we start to wind up. I'll throw a, a, an intro and outro on this later, but this is your, your final shot to talk to the people listening. So what do you want, want to leave them with? What final words do you have for them? Well, since it's a martial arts show, learn martial arts from a teacher that has the proper character and just doesn't say, do as I say, not as I do. And it was teaching you how to be a better person, not just a, a better kick or a puncher. That's the best I can tell them. One of my favorite things about this episode was that just when you thought the story had a path, it veered. And a lot of times when we think about someone's path shifting, we see it as a negative. And in this case, in every instance, it was a positive. It yielded something more and different, and better. And I love that martial arts has the power not only to create those transitional points, but to help people move forward. Mr. Giordano talks about how, yeah, he taught, but what martial arts truly did for him was beyond becoming a martial arts instructor. He found additional ways to take what he learned, the discipline he developed through his training, and use it in various ways to give back. So, sir, thanks for coming on. Had a great time talking. I appreciate all that you shared today. Hey, listeners, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com if you're not already listening to this episode from there, and check out the photos that he sent over. Check out the links, and I hope that you'll consider checking out his book. If you're up for supporting us and the work that we do, well, you've got a lot of options. We've got some books. You can find them on Amazon. We've got our Patreon account, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And of course, if you want the easiest, freest thing that you could do, you could share this episode with someone that you may think would appreciate it. You want to bring me to your school? Maybe have me teach a seminar? I'd love to come join you. Just reach out. We'll find a way to make it happen. If you pick up something at the store, don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. 
And if you have guests or topic suggestions, maybe some general feedback, find something on the website that you're like, hey, here's a way you could make that better. We want to hear all that and even more. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.